Here's, we're going to try and call this a stroll through the galactic neighborhood. And my, if I can accomplish anything with you folks tonight, it's that you'll never look at the sky the same way again. And I think for most of you, I'll do that. We'll see, though. So we're going to start here with an outline, since we're calling it a stroll through the galactic neighborhood. We're going to start, if you're strolling through the neighborhood, you sort of imagine you're a little kid and you start to explore the world around you. You start first with learning home, then you kind of get to know the neighborhood a bit better, then you actually you know, become a teenager and you maybe drive around town and then ultimately you become a young adult and you explore the countryside. So what we're going to do here, home is going to be our lovely planet here, Earth. The neighborhood will be the solar system. Our town will be the galaxy. And then, well, the country will be the whole entire universe, which is a pretty big place. In fact, I think the first thing I should do is try to explain to you how big the universe is and try and put it in some kind of terms that you can appreciate. So I got a trivia question for you. And feel free to yell out the answers. There's no, there's, there's no uh, penalties if you're wrong. But if you think of each star as a grain of sand, how much sand would it equal to have all the stars on a dark, moonless night? If you're up in the Muskokas, dark skies, no light pollution. How about all the stars in our own Milky Way galaxy? And how about all the stars in the known universe? Well, this is a moonless night up in the Muskokas. A thimbleful of sand, which is about 5,000 to 10,000 stars. That's what you can see within our own little corner of the galaxy. It's not that much. How about our whole entire galaxy? Well, it would fill a wheelbarrow. Probably about 100 billion, if you read your little cards there on the tables, you know that. So that's the Milky Way. Every star you see isn't even a fraction of that, because every star you've ever seen fits in the thimble. How about the entire universe? Well, if you had one of these hoppers, you know, full of sand. Now, you know we all come to the train station, or the, the stops where the gate is down and, and the trains are going by. So imagine one of these going by every second, every minute, every hour, every day, every week, 24-7 for three years straight, then you'll hit all the stars in the entire universe. So it's a lot of sand out there. And we only see one, yeah, I'm glad I hear a wow. I'm impressed with this. Let's look at it this way. How big is your fingernail? If you hold your fingernail out of the sky, it hides probably two million galaxies. Galaxies, which each have hundreds of billions of stars. This is the Hubble deep field that helped prove that. They focused the Hubble telescope on a very small niche of the sky. That's the only star within our galaxy that we're seeing. Every other little thing you see in there is an entire galaxy. So there's a lot of galaxies out there just when you hold your finger out. Now let's even try and understand the vastness of our own solar system. So I like to think about the distance here. I use the golf ball analogy. So I brought a golf ball here. Let's imagine this is the sun. This is our beautiful star called Sol. My good friend Rob Bala, who I'm sitting next to, he has a pen. I want you to hold that up. The ball point on the pen is Earth. And this is about the equal distance between the Sun and the Earth, relatively speaking. So that kind of gives you an appreciation. The Earth is just that little ballpoint. Okay, good boy, Rob. Um, <laughs> now let's think about Pluto, which is the smallest item. Well, you know, depends on how you define our solar system, but that's the, the dwarf planet that's farthest out of the nine that we tend to typically think of. Pluto would be about a one and a quarter football fields away. The closest star, the next golf ball away, would be in Halifax. And the next galaxy would be at Jupiter, on this scale of the golf ball. So even our solar system is pretty vast indeed. But let's start with home. There's no place like home, and the best thing to think about for Earth is the atmosphere, because that's where most of the neat stuff happens with Earth. I love this picture. I think everybody has seen it. This was from Apollo 17. 
the last Apollo mission on their way back after they've been to the moon, so they're about halfway between moon and the earth. It was beautiful because the sun was very close to behind them, so it helped show essentially a full earth. 99 times out of 100, if you see a picture of earth, it is this picture, and it is the most published photo in history. And I think it shows earth in all its beautiful glory. And you got a little ladybug there. So you, we don't just have them just in Midhurst, cats, when I told you. If you think of Earth like a, a basketball and you paint just one good thick layer of varnish around it, that is our atmosphere. That's how thin and precious that little thing is that's leading to all the problems we have in the climate crisis, global warming, and everything like that. I love the atmosphere because it leads to beautiful things like this, you know, beautiful sunsets. This is actually from our cottage. There's Crown Island there, Rob. Um, and the one thing that's kind of neat about a sunset when everything starts to skew in the orange is because the light is actually coming through 13 times as much atmosphere as when it's overhead because, of course, it's skimming the entire surface of the planet. All the blues diffract away and you get these beautiful orangey, ready things. And, of course, once it sets, you get all these amazing different colors and you can see the entire spectrum of the rainbow if the, if the lighting is right. I think all of us have stopped to appreciate uh, a sunset. But what you probably don't think about is, is that there's some neat things once the sun sets over. If you turn around and you have a view from behind you, you can see this. Now that's the moon. But does anybody know what this is, this darker color down here? Anybody? This is our Earth's shadow. As the sun sets, this part of the sky is still being lit up high by the sun, but this part isn't anymore. And you can actually see the shadow of Earth, and with time it will actually climb higher and higher, and that's essentially night enveloping your night sky. So make sure the next time you love a sunset, you look behind you 180 degrees and see how it looks there. Now, another beautiful thing that uh, we can get with the atmosphere is a rainbow. This happens to be in uh, Lhasa, Tibet. This is the Potala Palace. I just think it's a beautiful shot there. But we've all seen rainbows as well, right? I mean, I'm not telling anything you have already know. Already know. It goes from red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, violet. And it's usually a bit brighter on the inside, a bit darker on the outside. You've seen them all before. But I'm sorry, I got two three scientific slides, or more scientific, but I want to tell you how rainbows work because I was always fascinated by this. So the sun is behind you, the droplets of rain are in front of you, and the rainbow is actually between you and the droplets. The light comes across, bends when it hits the rain droplet, bounces, and then bends and comes out. And because it diffracts here, just like Einstein's, or I mean, um, Sir Isaac Newton's little prism, that's why red comes out on the outside and then blue on the inside. And so it's a very precise angle. Now, how many of you, though, have ever noticed that secondary rainbow that sometimes occurs? Yeah, if the, if the lighting is right and it's really good conditions, you can see it. It's always there, but it's not always easily visible. This helps you to realize how bright it is inside the rainbow. It's darker outside. And then that secondary rainbow is actually a flip of the colors the red is on the inside there, and the uh, violet is on the outside. And that's because, as I showed you here, there can be, this is the second science -y slide, the light comes in, bends, bounces, bends, and comes out. But it can actually bend, bounce, bounce a second time, and then bend coming out. And so the angle is steeper, and the light has flipped again one more time. So you can see that, and you can appreciate here why it's brighter inside, because all of the light tends to reflect within the angle of the rainbow.